made your minds with a lot of influence who... Can I have you hold that box? Oh, sure. All right, roll cameras. See, this is what happens when you got real talent. It just goes. Four cameras rolling. Red dots, everybody? Cool. The floor is yours. So we have this ominous continuity among major minds with a lot of influence, including transatlantic influence on the states. We have, prior to the break, Fichte in Prussia, Spinoza in Holland, and Calvin really beginning in Geneva and spreading all over where where his theology spread. But the father of this, at least in the form of written documentation that's easily available, has to be Plato, the Greek aristocrat who speaks through the mouth of Socrates and writes two influential utopias, one well-known, the Republic, and one not so well-known, the Laws, which is the product of his mature reflection on what needs to be done. And all four of these men, and we could, if we had time, do 40, but these four major names spanning European history agree that the ordinary population is A, very dangerous to the social order if it learns how to think and if its imagination remains intact. And furthermore, we have this corollary that there is no way to improve this. And what I've left out is the killer app that occurs in the middle to the end of the 19th century from one of the wealthiest families on planet Earth, the family of Charles Darwin and their former Anglican minister trained son, Charles who in his second major publication, The Descent of Man, says that the evolutionarily retarded are fatally dangerous to the physical integrity of the human race, the advance of civilization, because of the few evolutionarily advanced, like the Scandinavian blondes and the English blondes, crossbreed, God forbid, with the Irish or the Spanish, evolution will march backwards into the swirling mists of the dawnless past, and nothing can change that. Maybe a few million years might change it. Certainly nothing that current generations can do. Darwin, of course, is in every school, including every elementary school in the United States, probably the world, and no one bothers to mention that he doesn't say the human race is evolving. There's a few, a fraction are evolving. Now, put yourself if you're watching this, in the position of a responsible person who learns that. As someone who's made worldly success, has a little bit of time on their hands and resources, and now you know that if these ordinary people walking around in the American democracy, if they happen, if they happen to crossbreed with your daughter, evolution is going to march backwards. You now have a justification beginning in 1871, second to none. You can argue with Calvin. You can argue with Spinoza. You can argue with Plato. You can argue with Fichte. 
This is science and mathematics. And furthermore, and an unknown connection that has for some reason escaped the attention of the Darwinians. Darwin's earlier cousin, Thomas Malthus, has said there is no way mathematically to feed the poor because if you feed them, they'll reproduce more successfully, and then there'll be twice as many, then four times as many, that population expands geometrically, but food only arithmetically. So we, and, and of course in Darwin's diaries, he said that his pursuit of the secrets of biology are stimulated by the work of his cousin Malthus. Now we have, after Darwin's two blockbusters, the second of which... I'm going to raise my hand from now on. Yeah. What's the full name of Darwin's Origin of Species? The, the progress of the favored races, and he does not use the term race the way we do. He recognized about 57 separate races, of which the Irish are on the very bottom. Thank goodness he said that because a respectable percentage of every audience I speak to, that you'd otherwise be reluctant to say these things to, is derived from, anybody here derived from a partial Irish background? <laughs> you, you know, he said the Irish are hopeless. There is no hope for the Irish. Uh, of course, what's left out of simply relating what Darwin said is his training as an Anglican minister. And if you happen to pick up the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, hundreds and hundreds of years preceding Darwin, you find that God's will is to divide all the living creatures and plants into an infinite number of layers and to attempt to leave the layer you're placed in is the worst sacrilege at all. So that Darwin's theory fully explicated is the Anglican homily of obedience. Homily of obedience says exactly what Darwin says hundreds of years ago. Don't try to get out of your biological category because it's hopeless. And prior to that, don't try to get out of your spiritual category because it's hopeless. There's a great similarity between the two ideas. Now if you set out to find evidence that this is so, it's much easier than simply setting out to look at the, you know, the abundance of natural forms. So the real actor in the piece Darwin's a shy man, fantastically wealthy. That's been left out of all the fantastically wealthy. The high-tech, upper-class purchase of the day was Wedgwood pottery, and that's the source of the Darwin family wealth. So Darwin's first cousin is a man I was taught in high school back in the early 1950s, is estimated to be the most intelligent single human being ever lived. I was told that over and over. His name, Francis Galton, a world famous explorer, mathematician inventing little statistical formulae to discriminate shades of quality that the schools are infested with. And he has, Mr. Galton, a worldwide following of Galton clubs, including in the United States. He makes several pilgrimages to the U.S. to spread the insight 
that a menace to the human race exists in 95% of the population, and there has to be a way to put them, render them harmless. School, recommended by Fichte, Spinoza, Calvin, and Plato, that's the way to do it, and we'll defend this with precise mathematical signs. We will keep to ourselves the biological reason. Meanwhile, we've got to find a way for the biologically advanced to breed with one another. If you will trace the founding years of the elite private boarding schools in the United States, with the exception of no more than six, you will discover that all of the male and female emerge in the 30, including the women's colleges, the seven sisters, in the 30 years after the descent of man, which will be in every respectable library in the United States, and of course overseas too. I urge you, especially if you're Irish, to pick it up and read it. <laughs> You will not be disappointed to find yourself at the bottom of all the races on earth. <laughs> Just as the English without Darwin would have agreed. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, anyway, so this package of high level evidences, contentions, is capstone with scientific mathematical evidence and the proselytizing of Francis Galton, vigorous, rigorous. Out of that comes in the period right after the American First World War, a phenomenon in country fairs all over America called the Better Families Competitions. You set up the criteria for ranking and you know, you present your daughters like prize heifers to be rated by the judges. So we have a series of these reinforcements of Darwinian theory, which is really a reinforcement of Anglican theology or Calvinist theology, or Platonic philosophy, or Fichtean philosophy, or if you want to go liberal, uh, of uh, Spinozan philosophy, until finally we get to this cap. So now the cap is off the tunnel to hell, because not only are people justified in setting up a form of schooling, that's anti-educational, but they're doing either nature's work or the Lord's work. You decide. You want to go Calvin, you're doing the Lord's work. You want to go nature, you go... Spinoza. Yeah, yeah. So the, all of this wonderfully rich fabric of foundation is right on the surface. Someone has to point your attention to it. Please, no one watching say, oh, this fellow Gatto has spun off, you know, this phenomenal, interesting, but wacky theory. I didn't spin off anything. I took the dots and I connected them. And I said, they're identical from 300 BC until post Darwin Galton comes a German, a, a Prussian uh, psychophysicist named Wilhelm Wundt, who is the premier behavioral psychologist on Earth. And now let me spring a bombshell on all of you. The only place in the world for a long, long time you could get a PhD degree was either Prussia, University of Berlin, Leipzig, these little nests of Germanic countries, 
So from all over the world came the sons of the most powerful families, beginning in 1814 or 16 in the United States, when a guy who later became the governor of Massachusetts went over to get his PhD degree. By the 1870s, 1880s, it was a flood from Japan, from Russia, from everywhere. And now they return to their home countries, not because they have a PhD degree or they made presidents of universities, heads of government bureaus, because their families have clout. And now that's become the ticket to intellectual management. That's how these Prussian ideas spread like wildfire. There's only one university in the United States who doesn't have a president with a Prussian PhD, and he's close. I think he has a, a French PhD, because the French scrambled to try to get that degree, too. That's Titchener at Cornell, or the head of a all the, all the heads of psych departments, Prussian PhDs. So you now get this kernel of ideas, whether fanciful or scientific, everywhere. From Japan, I mean, everywhere are the same ideas. The Japanese Constitution in 1868 is scrapped, and the Prussian Constitution translated into Japanese. I mean, we're talking here the domination of ideas that's so interesting that what should make you suspicious is that no one ever heard of They heard of this detail, this detail. Why hasn't anyone joined them together? Well, I'll tell you what, a big shot professor at Columbia Teachers College told me 12 years ago when I bearded him in his den and I said, Doug, surely you know these things. Why, why is a junior high school teacher left to beat the drum? He looked at me and he said, not a good way to get tenure. That's all he said and I knew. I know that financial finally prize or penalty is enough to control the way we all think. And these things have been studied since the Collegia in ancient Rome. Armies have put together these insights. Churches have put together these insights and passed them down in an unbroken string to their sons, usually. And of course, the daughters catch as catch can, but eventually to both. If I could notice the pattern that you're describing, it seems that people are irrational. They come up with ideas of utopias, and then they, in order to get this utopia, compulsory schooling. And then they found a bunch of different ways, in the latest, using science, to make people think that this is how it has to be. But when you look at the, uh, you know, the real effects of Darwin in the form of, uh, say, eugenics and the role it played uh, well, in uh, America. That's Gal Galton is the inventor. His first cousin is the inventor of eugenics and the chief global distributor. There's one major exception to this, and the people who claim to be a follower of the exception claim to have read his book like the Bible, have never seen him say what I'm about to say. I'm talking about the so-called father of capitalism, the, the, the wealth of nations, Adam Smith, who in the first 15 pages says there's no difference between the Duke's son and the street sweeper's son except early training. A dead giveaway that this idea was known 
to be highly dangerous, and I don't think this has ever occurred in publishing that I know of before or since. In the 189 reprint of Wealth of Nations, because it immediately became an international must-read, the publisher of the book, a man with the ironic name of William Playfair, an economist, takes his own author to task in the preface of the book. He said the social order would be destroyed by telling people that they were all capable of intellectual development. The only way we've progressed through thousands of years of history is to make them think they depend on our good will, uh, you know, for their bread and butter, let alone their safety and everything else. It's a scathing upgrade of his own immortal author, Adam Smith. But Smith is, as far as I can see, other than minor figures like Florence Nightingale, and I'm not even sure about her, he's the only one who says what ought to be obvious on the face of it. It became obvious to me when I was given five classes a day to teach in the middle of Manhattan's Gold Coast of the Upper West Side. So I taught the, the sons and daughters of the media darlings and the sons and daughters of the professoria and, and the doctors and lawyers, but I also taught the kids from Spanish Harlem and from Black Harlem who never eaten off a tablecloth in their life, nor was I raised with a very democratic outlook. It wasn't an undemocratic outlook, but it wasn't stress. So you could hardly call my family in modern terms liberal, although I hope we'll discuss that's not a dirty word at all. It's what you ought to be aiming to be. And because my German grandfather, who cried out in the middle of the street in Mon City for German victory during the Second World War, even though his son was an infantry commander at the Battle of the Bulge, but he was calling for German victory. Uh, let me see if I can, if I can tone down my enthusiasm for, for well, a large percentage of the population at the time at the time was German. And oh, right was now a, there was a whole swing of you know pro-German up until like 1913, and then all of a sudden uh, the Germans uh, were Huns and ad hominem uh, attacks. Uh, right, Adolf Hitler. In my, the reason you don't find Mein Kampf everywhere isn't that it's a dull book. There's a center section that's a tribute to the United States as the most pure Germanic country on earth. The 10 foot portrait of Henry Ford behind Hitler's desk and Sigmund Freud's nephew. Bernays. Edward L. Bernays was the public relations man for Nazi Germany. That's why you don't find that would disturb people to know. So best they don't know that stuff. Anyway, I uh, partly out of uh, a kind of natural egalitarianism that comes from a strong working class population around Pittsburgh will break your nose if you insult them rather than beg for mercy. Uh, I decided, and partly because of laziness, I decided with my five classes a day to impose the same material on all five classes, the same quality of discourse, make no differentiation at all. Certainly made my life easier. But what I had done was throw away the assigned curriculum, which I believe was. Jack London, and, and, and nothing wrong with Jack London, a lot of fun to read, 
But if you want to exercise your mental muscles, that's not the way to go. And I had taken from Cornell and Columbia and Reed College in Oregon, which are the major colleges I attended, I had taken a level of uh, text fully equal to that. And what I discovered was, apart from cosmetic differences, maybe a little less grammatical, maybe shorter papers and stuff, that the level of intellect in the ghetto black population and the ghetto Hispanic population was really quite equal to the others. That wasn't a political belief I wanted to impose. Let me give you one example. I had a little black kid named Gregory Smith. Gregory, I hope somehow or other you're alive and you're listening to this. And I'm replacing Jack London with Moby Dick, the most difficult American novel ever written that explores all the great ideas of European history, predestination, and all the rest. And I'm holding forth on those ideas at the same time we're reading a book that's way beyond anything in difficulty they've ever read. And I hear a crash. I look, and Gregory Smith has fallen asleep and crashed to the floor. Well, I'm fresh out of Pittsburgh. And the way we deal with people like that is to kick them with the soles of their feet. They wake up real quick. That's the way the cops do to us when we're making out under cars around Pittsburgh. And if our feet stick out, they kick our feet. So anyway, Craig wakes up, and I'm very insulting, and he said, I don't need to pay attention. I learned that stuff in third grade. We're in eighth grade now. So I'm really insulting, but I say, what do you mean you learned that in third grade? He said, well, I learned that there are these sets of ladies who weave your future and you can't change it. Either the Norns in Scandinavia or the Fates in Greece. And as I was reeling back from that, because he'd made a connection Cornell and Columbia never made for me, between predestination and these, he said, and, and I learned these things from the visiting science teacher called genes and chromosomes, and they di dictate the color of your hair and how you scratch your nose. You can't change that. So I don't need to listen to you talk about predestination. Well, at that minute, I mean, at that exact second, I said, this kid has written a PhD thesis that'll become a book, you know, that'll make his living for the rest of his life, and he's Gregory Smith, a stupid kid. Yeah, you know, and then I completely opened my eyes, and sure enough, behind the street idiom was active mentality, you know, fresh ideas. It just had been treated with such disrespect for so many years, it wasn't worth bothering to waste it on a school teacher. It revolutionized my teaching. But then over the balance of the, that was the first year I taught, of the 29 years I taught, I decided to use the fresh eyes and perspectives of the so-called hopeless ghetto kids. And huge benefits flowed to me, and I hope some to them too, because I took what they wanted to do seriously. If Jamal Watson wanted to do nothing but draw comic books in the back of the class, I would go back and use my superior experience, not intelligence, to say, listen, Jamal, I used to read comic books. And if you want to do this seriously, 
you're doing it wrong. And he'd get angry and say, I'm the best in the school. I said, yeah, maybe, I said. But in a real comic book, all the panels aren't the same size. Look at the one you're copying from. They're all different sizes to show movement. And in a real comic book, the figures don't stay inside of the box. The head comes out, the fist comes out. I said, look, you're copying and you don't see that. Why don't you take a week out of school, go to the local public library, I'll cover for you, take down a stack of books on graphic art and learn what you're doing. I mean, that's a worthwhile use of your time. So I found out that each person one girl wanted to do nothing but swim, and she snored in class. And when I finally said to her, what's going on? She said, I've devoted my life to being an Olympic swimmer. She's 13. And I said, well, why don't you do that for the rest of the year? You can't do it in school. We don't have a swimming pool. But they're about... 150 public swimming pools in New York City. Why don't you plot them out on a map with pins or stickers, visit every one of them, set up a rating for these swimming pools. Concentration of chemicals in the water, depth of the pool, length of the lane, lighting, access, cost, and you will produce an information reference that will make you somebody, because I'll go around to the local public library and say you're doing that, and could you be cataloged? Because who else has such a reference as this? Well, she was. Her life was transformed because I treated her time and her with respect. But meanwhile, if you took any, I mean any of the subject areas, you could find that she was developing muscles in, in each one of them. We got a call from New York, that's a city magazine in New York, about midway through the school year, and they said they had heard about this and they wanted to buy the data, and they would pay $500 for it. I said, you mean you want to publish your art? Well, no, we would put our own writer's name on it. This girl, I doubt if she'd ever seen a $10 bill in her life. I'm offering her $500. She said, no, it's mine. If they want to use it, they'll put my name on on it, which they weren't willing to do. So, but, but I know that was the beginning of a transformation in her life. A famous American writer, somebody that uh, the uh, New York senator from Harvard, what was his name, a fruity voice, uh, very famous one, uh, go back 10 years. Who am I talking about? He wrote... No, prior to that, but he coincided with Cuomo. No, he was, uh, uh, he had written books about uh, the plight of poverty, but they weren't sympathetic books. He was nationally famous, and he was so florid as a, a public figure that, uh, ah. in any case, I had a friend who had flunked out of uh, Cornell. I'm, I'm reluctant to mention his name without, because he's a nationally famous writer about assassinations. And this famous New York senator said publicly that he was the world's foremost assassination expert. Well, you now know that he was a flunk out from Cornell. So how did this happened because when he saw the Kennedy assassination, I had driven him to Cornell, and he was trying to plead his way back in. And Kennedy was assassinated. We stayed up all night. We both agreed if anything happened to the assassin, 
that none of the information could be trusted in the next morning or afternoon, and that was it for the assassin. So he went back to Cornell as a flunkot, talked a big time professor, Andrew Hacker, whose dad started the general studies program at Columbia, into giving him a PhD or the beginning of one without ever going to class. He would spend all his time writing a book about the, not the Kennedy assassination, about the composition of the Warren Commission, which I thought was a very clever way to sidestep, you know, all the, uh, you know, yellow journalism stuff. It became, Inquest it was called, it became a national bestseller. It led to an all expenses paid PhD at Harvard. Then he wrote a book about the De Beers diamond mines. They took him in in South Africa as a house guest for a long, long time. And he wrote a book saying diamonds are essentially worthless because they have thousands of years of flawless diamonds already put away. Then he talked his way into the NBC newsroom and wrote this magnificent investigative study called News from Nowhere about how news actually is selected for transmission. In other words, everything he touched was, this is a flunk out from college. So all these anomalies from the Harlem kids, the Spanish Harlem kids from my flunk out Cornell friend, finally shook my belief in what I had been taught, that it's an orderly universe, merit determines, and I could begin to see around me all the narratives that were disconnected from reality. They hardly were hidden at all. You know, they were all weapons of mass destruction narratives. And they occurred over and over and over again in every aspect, including in the world of medicine and nutrition. You know, there seemed to be no ethical or moral uh, break on what insiders were able to say and all the other insiders would agree with. So that when I turned to what obviously was wrong with school was that we were creating, I, as a school teacher, was creating the hideous discipline problems that we then said we must have money to relieve. That it seemed like a closed universe in which one hand washed the other one. That all these horrible kids, from horrible ghettos were perfectly able to rise into valuable contributors. And it wasn't a very long distance to go. For example, I remember one, I, uh, I started a school year with, they were trying to get rid of me as a teacher. They gave me the worst class uh, on the eighth grade, the kids were huge. They had no tradition of scholarship at all. But I determined to utterly ignore that and to say that we were going to start with Shakespeare's three most important plays. And if they could master the parts that I was willing to cut them loose from school, for months, and they could travel around elementary schools, put these plays on, and then talk about the problems of staging them, of mastering the character, or something or other. And I'd say 10 days went by. It was as if I was in 
a Harvard seminar, and all of a sudden, some kid burst out laughing in the middle of, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, resolve itself into a do. What are you laughing about? Don't you know? He said, we're the dumb class. The, you know, and from that point on, it was no longer easy because the other dumb kids had had the illusion, but it wasn't an illusion, broken. But we still got some good work done. We invent the problems that we then have to solve. That's what I think all experts do. I don't think, including brain surgery, that there's anything the human skill is capable of that's very hard to learn. It takes some time. So you can benefit from prior experience, but it doesn't take anywhere near the time, expense. So the point is that individuals have an innate, infinite potential, and that we're not limited by genes or species or Even race. Even the lust or... to. People wish to learn. It used to be called emulation. You're around somebody who can do something well. Of course you respect. I mean, you're watching how they do it. Yeah, you know, we talked earlier about the disadvantage adopted kids ha have. When you watch your mother and father and you're 14 months old and have no language, you're still seeing how they deal with frustration, how they merge with one another or not contend with one another. You're seeing so many hundreds of skills that, in fact, you're biologically programmed to, to imitate. Later, when the mind kicks in, you have some selection, which ones to, and which ones to. But uh, we don't allow that to happen because the very first thing schools do is strip the experience base away. I mean, the easiest way to turn your kids into geniuses. I mean, by the time they're seven, it's just to front load huge amounts of experience, including dangerous experience. And my favorite story is Richard Branson tells it in his autobiography. His mother, who was an airline stewardess in 1946 flying the Atlantic, so not exactly, you know, the safest thing to do, she was desperate that he wouldn't become a dependent. And so when he was four years old, picture 48 months, he, she drove him miles from their London home in Shamley Green and asked him if he thought he could find his way home from there. And he said he thought he could get out and do so. Then she said, and now he said, where is he? He doesn't even have many words, you know. So eight or nine hours later, when he finds his way home, he said nothing in his life ever seemed hard for him to do again. He drops out of high school, never goes to college, has his first million bucks by the time he's 19 by figuring out what people need and want and giving it to them cheaper or better or bringing anyone to offer it. What would the, our society be if we put millions of people through the same experience? I think it would be closer to what colonial America was and early federal America, when nobody wanted to work for somebody else, they wanted an independent livelihood. It would be closer to that than the corporate hell that we have now, with the corporations following perfectly rational logic 
have begun to need less and less people, but they have such political control over the legislatures and the federal government that there's no way to arrest this progress. Furthermore, as I spoke at General Motors about 10 years ago, and a mid-level executive told me when I asked him, you know, you guys had the world, there wasn't any competition. What happened? You know, I remember when Jap cars came in, they had names like the Bluebird and the Fair Lady. I mean, it was a joke. What happened? And he said, what happened was this, that engineering, which used to be the fast track to the executive suite and profit sharing and all the rest of that good stuff, stopped being the fast track. Finance became the fast track, taking these huge profits, speculating in variable rate mortgages, in foreign currencies, that became the road. The same thing that happened to the steel industry in Pittsburgh. Wasn't moved out of Pittsburgh because any of them were losing a penny. They are making great profit. It's at the Harvard B School boys said, look, you can take this money, make a lot more, and not work. Of course, that would get rid of 100,000 steel workers, truck drivers, but who the hell cares about them? Didn't Darwin say they're not evolving, they're all Irish anyway? Well, this is, this is the juxtaposition between eugenics and that type of mentality where people are under control and someone like Branson who gets to go on walkabout, which yeah. is a rite of passage, yeah. which was around in the yeah. founding of this country with high uh, literacy rates, and so when we had a high entrepreneurship, self-reliance, literacy rates, people who had critical thinking and knew how to deal with problems on their own, because if not, you might die. Or other people think badly of if you said, I want a job for, you know, what do you want to do? Right, right. Uh, but, but these different uh, compartments are intimately interlocked. So by studying one and the other as if you're going to pass a short answer test, you're disabling your... This, Fragmenting. Yeah, yeah. The uh, synthesizing power of your mind, which is what enables you to strike out so that history doesn't infinitely repeat itself. But now that's been restricted to such a small fragment of the population that we're in desperate trouble internationally because the Chinese, the Japs, the Malaysians can do this brain paralysis much better than we can because they have traditions that allow that. And we still turn out on the 4th of July and say, home of the free, land of the brave, whatever. Uh, so if someone were to walk away from this segment saying, what did he say? It's that the bad things done in school have been intellectually justified, and you're not going to change that set of mind. So all the effort you make to systematically change schooling is a huge waste of time, energy, and resources because now the majority of the important people in the country make their living either directly from that or indirectly because you no longer have uh, a critical mind. And what is the definition of marketing? that when I took marketing at Columbia, they taught me it's overcoming sales resistance. Well, if there is no sales resistance, you know, you do that by juggling balls and dancing. Here's a pretty girl, buy the product. You can have her. You know, it's quite a pickle that we're in, not our managers don't think they're in a pickle, but they are too. 
because the Chinese, for example, are so much more well-versed, you know, in screwing rival power. <laughs> We've only been around a few hundred years. Yeah, they're reeling us in very nicely, thank you. If they cashed in the bonds they hold right now, for just forget, the dollar is paper. Give us our money back. How are populations kind of prepared and indoctrinated and conditioned into receiving, you know, such such uh, low, there's, they, they provide such low resistance to the Ponzi scheme mentality yeah, of yeah, the predators. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about leverage, and it has been studied since ancient Rome, is you don't have to do everybody. You just have to do a few opinion makers. They do the rest. Here's how Andrew Carnegie did it with the Protestant churches of the United States. He simply, in one fell swoop, donated a brand new organ to every church in the United States. This died in the wool atheist, opened his purse, everybody got a new organ. Do you suppose there was much, anyone turned the organ down, or there was much resistance? Now you accept the organ, but you know, you grew up in a Christian tradition. You Don't you thank Mr. Carnegie for his organ? Don't you, being human, hope that something else will follow that organ? And to, you bet you do. How did Carnegie and Rockford get a hold of the schools? There were no pensions for teachers. The government didn't set up the pension system. Rockefeller and Carnegie set up the pension system out of their own pockets. And of course, they didn't give it to everybody. Your school had to conform with what they said was a balanced educational diet. Four credits of whatever they were, two credits of math, whatever they were. You could compete for the pensions if you followed the Carnegie credit system. Is there any school in the country who didn't? I never heard of one. How could you? Because the local parents would say, what are you nuts? You're not taking this free money? I mean, what you're doing isn't so great anyway. Why don't you do it his way? So this whole uh, religion of leverage which has just accumulated over more than 2,000 years, is utterly unknown except to seminar courses at the most elite colleges. You know, you may have a rough idea what leverage means from a physics course and see how, you know, connections, but you don't have any idea how you can plan the future for an entire region or a nation or a city by using leverage. The Chautauquas used the leverage. The best leverage available wasn't the newspapers, although it was good, it was the pulpits. And so mixed in with the real things the Chautauqua wanted to teach, were traveling Christian ministers. The whole Harper's publishing empire is, I think it's Methodist, but don't hold me to that. Maybe it's Baptist. I think, and I think the Rockefellers are Baptist. Baptist. Yes. But they're not Baptist like other, you know, there's about 40 kinds of Baptists. There's one small fragment of Baptists who are like Episcopalians. I forget the name of it. I was when I was studying the Quaker transformation from pious, humble people to among the most powerful, certainly the most powerful small sect in the country. There are only a hundred thousand Quakers. They've had two American presidencies out of forty. 
So that's five percent, and they're you know Nixon this. Being the most recent, right? Huh? Nixon being the most recent. Nixon and Hoover. Right. So uh, you can't think clearly, and all you computer folk know unless the data is available you can't think clearly well someone knew that thousands of years ago what data to remove how to spin a local authority into your scheme let him do the work school teachers i was about to say by and large you're innocent they're all innocent because if they're not innocent they're gotten rid of they're drawn out of a pool of college graduates. The New York Times says are the lowest single scoring graduates on standardized exams except for school administrators who of all the uh, coherent occupational groups in the country they're 50 points below the teacher group. So the managers, so-called, are the dumbest people of all. They know that their paycheck depends on, because there's 20 people to take their job. They don't want, they may sit in a parents' meeting and say, we've got to do something different. But they're listening to the, Tom Tom's telling them what to do different. And of course, what to do different always says, identify the most influential parents. They're not always the richest. Do something different for those people. They'll be gone in three or four years. Then go back and do what you always did. So that's, if, if you looked at schools in... 19.5 in schools today, the correspondences are overwhelmingly similar. You would not say, wow. You would say, hey, history hasn't moved. Frederick Gates helped out Rockefeller at a time when the family was getting a bad reputation and like Carnegie, they were having a lot of labor disputes. Uh, how does the idea of philanthropy and altruism affect American education? Philanthropy and altruism, as it occurs through the institution of the private corporate foundation, is the explanation for what's called American education. Let's us call it American schooling. That's a pretty comprehensive condemnation. Do I have any evidence for that? Yes, I do. The two congressional investigations of where schools came from, one in 1915 by a guy named Walsh, one in 1959 by a guy named Carol Reese, both came to the identical conclusion that all the mysteries vanish at least source mysteries when you see how the foundations which don't spend very much money use leverage to control the curriculum the testing system the public uh, uh, perception of what's going on and of those foundations until very recently Rockefeller Carnegie and Ford were the ringleaders. They had divided uh, responsibility. Uh, Ford took uh, Uh, let me not misstep here. Rowan Gaither was in charge of Ford at the time and he had met with Norman Dodd and, and Gaither says, well, Mr. Dodd, you know, we, we have direct uh, directives from the White House and we're, we're at, we at the Ford Foundation are ex-CIA or OSS. The White House back in the uh, 20s and 30s set up conferences of experts in order to homogenize 
expert opinion because inside the expert body there were colossal names and if they spoke all the other chords fell into line. I think Ford took over the psychological uh, output of schooling. Uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie in different ways were attempting to globalize this thing, the Carnegie Foundation, still today, if you go up to their library, I think it's in Austin or around there, and just read their annual report for the Carnegie Corporation, everything you ever saw on the front page of the New York Times in relation to schooling was cooked up in the project offices, and then it's dumped on the world through the control of the media. How's the media control? Well, it's controlled through advertising. That's all. You can use your friends to buy more or buy less. When they come and say, why aren't you advertising? When you say, well, your point of view is so radical. Advertising? It's done. All right, cool. All right, so let's take at least a 15-minute break, cool this room off. I think the mechanics of how it's done is the most useful thing to someone just new to this. Because yeah. they say, well, it seems like everyone would have to be in on this, not only oh, a right. few. Yeah, right, absolutely. So. Yeah, we can we yeah. can cover that. We'll cool the room off. Let's get the lights off.